bridge right ahead of us up here. And this picture's taken looking from the other side of that bridge this way. You can see where the home used to be oh, yeah. right there, which was, was this home. Now, I've, and I just didn't put one in. There's a picture taken looking up the sidewalk toward the home. You come down here, the foundation's still there. Massive boxwoods. Yeah, so basically the sidewalk, the sidewalk went right in between the boxwoods here hmm. uh, and continued on through that next set. Well, this is, uh, they call it the Patterson place because. And I, I don't know for sure that the Pattersons built it, but I think probably so. There was a guy named Bob Patterson, who was a sheriff of Swain County for a time. He was, he was also the postmaster here. Um, so they, they called it the Patterson place by but Philip Russ, the guy that owned the, owned the property, did acquire this. And this is where Lawrence Heights folks lived. Mm -hmm. You probably remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had running water. You can see, uh, go up there, the upper side of it, just see some uh, residual from that. And their water came from uh, over to I.K. Stern's place. So there's a uh, tank up on the side of the hill up here, which you can't see from here. You probably can see it when you get back up the truck. Uh, concrete tank, which was fed from spring water a quarter mile away over on the other side of the creek. So they ran a pipe uh, from the I.K. Stearns place all the way over here. And according to Lawrence Hyatt, who grew up, in his, his earliest years were here. In fact, there's a picture of him. So this, this is a photograph taken by I.K. Stearns. The, you know, it says a color photograph. So that's Lawrence Hyatt. His daddy, Cole Hyatt. His mother, barely see her, Fanny Brindle. And that's Lawrence's sister with big bear skin now so uh, and they lived here that family in fact i think this picture was probably taken right up here and looking in that direction and i say that based on the shape of the, the mountains here but ik stearns was their neighbor from across the creek who took this picture uh, so philip rust uh, bought all this property and he he wanted to run sheep and so uh, he had a fenced-in sheep section on up above us, uh, up near Andrews Branch. And um, the bears got into the sheep. <laughs> so he put up, uh, I think it's five strand wire, electrified. And uh, Laura said one time a bear got through the electric fence, and got burned on the way in, and did not want to go back out. But then he had all those sheep in there. <laughs> So the sheep didn't fare too well on, as an enterprise on, on uh, Nolan Creek. And I'm sure this is, this is one of those. Now, he was, um, Cole Height was a warden for Philip Rust. Um, so Rust owned all his property. He did not want other people hunting and fishing on his property. So he hired, he had, uh, I think, four, four wardens. Uh, Lars told about there was a, a guy named a Leatherwood fellow from Bryson City who came over here and uh, Cole Height caught him fishing on Russ's property and warned him off. And so he, he left. About two weeks later, caught him again fishing, fly fishing. And uh, that time he didn't warn him. He had a shotgun with him and he blew his fly out of the water. <laughs> oh, so that was the end of the fly fishing for the day. But Rust uh, paid his employees basically double wage, double what they could get anywhere else. So he, he was good to his employees, but was not very open to sharing his property with the community. And in, you know, in a sense, um, you know, there are lots of pros and cons about the, the coming of the park. But if we did not have a park today, what we would have would be Philip Rust Empires. Uh, lots of, there'd be gated communities in here. 
and uh, none of us would have the access to it. I just let the, this is falling down now, but it's uh, the cistern that was fed from across the creek over by the I.K. Stern's place. So they ran pipe all the way over here and then just supplied the uh, house down below. You see right here. And I don't know if that's the, it goes in pipe or it goes out pipe. But this provided enough head for the water down at the house. <clears throat> and like I said, this came from across the creek and Lawrence said that they uh, he ran the pipe through hollowed logs packed with manure. And the manure was there as insulation. Here's a second set of steps here at the old Patterson place. It's still here. Of course, when you walk up to them, <laughs> you're not really going anywhere since the house is gone. What a beautiful place and how inventive that they had running water that come from a quarter of a mile away gravity fed into a tank and then run into their house. This is uh, Indian Creek. What's that? Well, next time we stop, you can just hop in the bed. I'm yeah. sorry? Next time we stop, you just hop in the bed, right? Well, when you drove by, I thought we should have hitched a ride. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We just drove right it's down a, on it. It's, dec it's decoration day for cemeteries. And so on decoration day, they open up the gate to allow folks to drive up in here. Uh, to, yeah, we're going to the cemetery. We didn't pass it, did we? No, you haven't gotten to the first one yet. So the, the first one, you're going to go up here just a little ways up. There's a bridge across to the right. Then you're going to go about another half mile to be a bridge across to the left. After you cross that bridge, the Nolan Creek Trail continues on this way. If you bear off, you'll see another road comes in. You bear off on the left of that one. That takes you to the first cemetery. But uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's about like that. See? Yeah. So we were looking for it on the way. I thought maybe we missed it. Yeah, and you pass. We pass the home site on the way to it that we're going to be visiting, which is IK, IK Star. You're actually going to pass, there's actually home site right here. Hey, is that right? Yeah. Well, if you want to, come on up here and we're going to talk about it. You can see the, road, the old road, the Indian Creek Road that connected. No one came up through here, and it goes on up in here for another two miles. Now, I followed that road up, and there's probably well, in addition to this home site, which is Quee Woody, there's at least three others on Indian Creek going on up through here. Um, and like, like I said, there was no industrial grade logging in here, but I'm confident that one of the reasons this, this is a fine road, I mean, it's a wagon size road here. I'm confident there was logging done at the head of Indian Creek, which was part of the, what, got the, uh, the road built. The Indian Creek is a, it actually breaks off where we were down out right there. Uh, there's another fork of it. It kind of splits off and so there's a little island right there. Uh, and it's, it's a fair size little, it's big enough to hold trout. This is a boxwood left over from the days the house was still here. Very spindly and tall, trying to find light, not like the boxwood you typically see manicured in front of houses and businesses. So here you got the fallen brick chimney. It's the only brick chimney on the creek. And uh, of course the home uh, was here. And um, that was built shortly before TVA took it, like around 1942. And it was the home of a fellow named Queeve Woody. I think I've got it. Yeah. So this is a picture taken. So you can see this, the drop off 
is mm -hmm. this right here. So the house kind of came out in front here. So the porch is kind of hanging out where we are right now. And um, this is I.K. Stearns and his two dogs. Uh, one of them is Joe Ghost and the other one's Kit. Queeve Woody, that's uh, Queeve Woody's mother-in-law. That's I.K. Stearns' wife. That's I.K. Stearns' aunt. I don't know who that girl is. That's another aunt of I.K. Stearns. And that's Queeve Woody's, his wife and their son. So there, that picture was taken, kind of looking this way. And you can kind of see that ridge line mm -hmm. in the disc. Can't see it much now. But so I.K. had a, I think Queeve built this because I.K. had a place on up here. Um, and so they were only in here for probably two years before it was taken and so Queeve Woody I don't know if you can't quite tell it here he lost part of his left arm in an accident down at Carolina Wood Tournament mm -hmm. so IK was a you may remember me talking about IK was the president of Carolina yeah. Wood Tournament yeah. and uh, had his place up in here which we'll go visit in a little bit so so I never knew IK didn't know him and his son and his his wife and also new male shank leatherwood so that that's miss jess who is who was his aunt and she was the president of carolina wood attorney company daddy absolutely adored her mm -hmm. uh, the day she died all the businesses in town shut down that afternoon for a funeral service uh -huh. So this is a perfect example of nature taking it back. Yeah. So that that looks like a really nice house. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean it was, and then today, right? Just the chimney falling mm -hmm. over is left. Yep. And that's it. Yeah, nature but, taking it back. The TVA most likely either they took either um, they allowed Queeve to take the lumber out or sold it to somebody else, or mm -hmm. they burned it one or the other. Or in their jargon, they melted it down. Mm. So this part that Matt's standing on right now, or kind of perched on, is actually the hearthstone for the chimney that Don was talking about. Looks like it would have been a big, nice one for sure. Then you can kind of see down inside the chimney that's fell over. That's going up through the chimney. And you can see the bricks. And this was the only brick chimney, Don said, in this whole area, which is amazing. Makes me wish I knew, well, it makes me wish I could see the house, of course, but then I think, what was the first fire ever built in the chimney? The last fire that was ever built in it. In this beautiful, beautiful place of Nolan Creek. Could you just imagine having a house here? And listening to that wonderful water seeing the beautiful trees. So this is where the chimney's laying down and you can see the brick. But see that round hole down there? Matt said that was called the thimble, a thimble. <laughs> and that was where another, like a wood cook stove probably would have been maybe near the fireplace and then a pipe piped the smoke from it into the chimney so that it went out the chimney. One of those houses where I, actually Lawrence's family lived in here for a while. Uh, said they, and I'm not sure why they moved from down there to up here, but they did. He said the day they moved out, Buford Messer, who was park ranger, moved in to here. Um, and I guess that was pretty much when they left Nolan Creek. That's what it looked like from back down, looking up the road mm -hmm. back then. And so we're, that structure right there is the house it was right here. And then there was a powerhouse that stood right over here. I'll show you in a minute. So there's that uh, the powerhouse right. with the flume to it. Right. And, uh, So 
we got the so it's you know driven by water over over hung water wheel and um, in uh, gearing flywheel generator exciter and that's and I have, I do not know where this it's not very can't be very far up this that's the dam it basically fed you can see the the beginning of the water box right there that fed that flume but it was a uh, uh, he had three phase power up here. Yeah. There's the base for the gear driver. Of course, the water wheel was, was over in here. What time frame would this power have been here? What what time? Well, Russ started buying property around 1930. He bought, I think he may have bought some in the late 20s. So sometime between then and when he left, it could have been you know from the early 30s on up to the late 30s or early 40s, oh, but amazing. that that time period. So you know, now he was not the only one who had electricity though. Yeah. Uh, Fred Lawless had electricity at his house yeah. from a little generator, yeah. um, and other and others had Delco systems, Delco yeah. farm systems. Mm. But in other words, they had electricity before a lot of the other areas in Western North Carolina. They had, le yes. I mean, but now most, to be fair, most of the people on the North and South shores did not have electricity. Yeah, okay. But the, so these was basically on an individual basis that they did. Um, Bryson City got electric power in the, well, shortly after 1910, the powerhouse on Deep Creek, you, I've told you about that. And then they got the Ela Dam in 1925. But there were many outlying areas of the county that didn't, didn't have power for a long time. Yeah. So there was no there was no power distribution in here. It was strictly just local yeah. generation. They're threaded too. Yeah, you can see all all four bolts there. And that, and that is the poison ivy I just rubbed up against. <laughs> but, uh, that was a, you remember the little story I wrote about the uh, rock walls and flowers and stuff? Yeah. That was the, the iris were out in here, uh, yellow iris. And there's daffodils, you know, jonquils, yellow bells, and so forth out in there. But, this is home of uh, John uh, Lequire, John and Abby Lee Lequire, and Abby Lee and Eddie, Eddie Lequire anyway. But um, I had always attributed the flowers being hers, you know. But it turns out that John was the flower lover, and he was the one that had the uh, garden patch out there. But all the Lequires, there were two homes below the road here, this one right here. And if you come on down here, you can see. And if you can see, you can see the chimney base down there. Mm -hmm. So that was the. Those are both owned by the Luke wires. But in addition to that, that little branch that we just passed over is, is the branch. And uh, they had children who lived up that branch. In fact, there's one on that hill uh, just right up there. Uh, so there's a. I should have the names on. Yeah, Clint Lequire lived in this home, so that's that's one of their sons. And that's the home that was right back up there, the John Lequire home. You can see they had some fruit trees out in the yard. Um, of course, a dirt yard, mm. a swept, swept clean. And there's a washing operation. And I don't know who these people are. That's got to be one of the Luke Wire girls. And then on this little knob right up here is where this Clyde Luke Wire home was. Um, and <laughs> this is my favorite. So they had two daughters named Carrie and Ferry Luke Wire, who married brothers Dave and Reuben Ball. Okay, so the Reuben Ball. Reuben and uh, Carrie live just a little ways up B Branch. This one's about three quarters of a mile up there. You can see 
see the size of the cabin compared to the cows. <laughs> I, I met um, two cousins. One of them was the daughter of um, one of the Luquire girls, and the other was the daughter of another Luquire girl. And, and one of them was the daughter of, of the fairy who lived up here. And I mentioned something about it being a small home. No, no, it was a big place that we had. We had that. <laughs> and you can't see, you see how steep the terrain is. So they got corn up there, and it drops off straight down to the branch down in there. I'll give you, I'll give you a copy of that picture. But there's a great story that um, Helen Boone, who was um, a, a granddaughter of them, uh, told us. So her mother was uh, Nellie Luquire, and uh, they were living here at the time. But uh, Nellie had a grandmother that lived somewhere over on the, in the southwestern part of the county, and so she went over to stay with her for a while, and uh, went to church with her one night. And there's a fellow, General George Washington Lowe, started courting her there, and uh, so they. She was there for a month or so, and he grew real sweet on it. All right, how are you? Oh, I'm a little tired. <laughs> well, you're going downhill mostly now anyway, right? <laughs> um, but at any rate, so she came back and been back here about a week, and here comes General George Washington Lowe on a horse he had borrowed from somebody to come. And he, he got here, and she was on her way to the spring to get some water had a bucket to get some water. And he went along with her and tried to hold her hand. She wouldn't hold his hand. And uh, got the water, brought it back, and he tried to kiss her, and she wouldn't, wouldn't kiss him. And uh, he hung around a while and said, uh, Nellie, I'd like for you to marry me. She said, I can't do that. He said, well, why not? Because I ain't got any shoes. <laughs> so, so General Lowe went to Bryson City, bought her a pair of shoes, and they got married the next day right, right oh, here. Oh, wow. What a great story. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the the balls that you were just talking about, so that's our line of family. Yeah, right, correct. that's right. Yes. They, we share, oh, what, man, it's way back. So there was an Osborne Ball who was a Civil War veteran who uh, lived in Cataloochee for a while, came over here, and he was um, a great grandson of a, a, a fella, I believe his name was Daniel Ball, who was also the great grandfather of our Noah Ball. So that's how we're, mm -hmm. like I said, there were, there were two of the Ball brothers that lived up this branch here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's called, it's not shown on the maps, but uh, they called it B Branch. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you were talking about, see, I would say LaCroix, so I'm saying it wrong. How did you say their name? Well, I'm just saying it the way that I grew up here. How you heard it, right? LaCroix. yeah. So that's so it's, it's spelled L-E-Q-U-I-R-E. Yeah. And I didn't grow up with that. I never seen that name until I met you and Jim and started researching Hazel yeah. Creek and all that. Well, now this so. the, the LaCroix have a they have a connection, like many of the families over here, particularly many of the families down toward Hazel Creek. They've got a Cage Cove connection. So the, the Luquires came from North Carolina. Uh, John Luquire's father was a fellow named Isaac Luquire. They moved to Cades Cove. Isaac served in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I think he's buried in, in Cades Cove area. But John came back over here. Yeah. Uh, in fact, John was born in uh, Tennessee. Yeah. But, the, but Isaac had been born in North Carolina. I'm not sure exactly where in North Carolina he, he was. But, they came from North Carolina to Tennessee, and in John's case, came back over. That's the same way with the Proctors, you know. Mm -hmm. The Proctors had uh, come from Cage Cove, came over, and one of their sons, James, uh, after he served in the Civil War, uh, came back and lived in Cage Cove for a while, came back over to Hazel Creek, lived for a while, went back over to Cage Cove. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where he died and was buried. Mm -hmm. How did they know to go back and forth? From here to well, there, there was a n numerous families connections. Like the Proctors had come to Hazel Creek from Cage Cove, and you know, but they they weren't from Cage Cove. They, they had 
gone to Cades Cove, lived there a while, came over to Hazel Creek. The second families that, normally the second family that came to the Hazel Creek area was Cables. They had come from Cades Cove over. And so you'll find that there's a cable mill over in Cades Cove. It's, it's all part of the, you know, Nolan Creek, most, most of the creeks on this uh, north side of uh, Fontana were industrially logged. Hazel Creek had Ritter lumber, Forney Creek had Norwood lumber, there's Montville lumber on Eagle Creek and uh, Kitchens lumber on uh, 20 Mile Creek. Neither Nolan nor Deep Creek was industrially grade log, now there, but there was logging here. Mm -hmm. uh, This filled in over time, but you can see clearly just a nice general grade line. And this goes all the way around to that, that cemetery, you know, where we were at the Stars mm -hmm. Place. So, just explain what it would have been used for. It's for floating logs. Uh, so, part of it, you, you can see where we crossed, we had to cross the road uh, back up here, but uh, we just basically fed water in here to float the logs to carry them down and my presumption is got down there to above that mill site and then just slid them down the side of the hill but I have I've followed it from actually not quite this far up but maybe another hundred yards down followed it all the way around and it's just like this whole way mm. and that, I mean that took a lot of work just to do the digging was it wa with water in here? Yeah. Is that how they put it? Well, see, so they had a, a dam up above us somewhere, probably into a flume, part of which was overhead. Had to be overhead when it crossed the road up here. And then it went all the way down to where, remember the Stearns place where we stopped? Mm -hmm. It came out down above, well up above us down there. That's awesome. That's wild. Been, you can see the rocks they've dug out yeah. just laid up here. That'd of course, horrible work. It's probably it, it was probably almost this wide. Yeah. You know, a lot wide. You know, a lot has filled in in the so intervening years. Look, that's another just huge rock face. It is, isn't it? Katie, so you see when it's uh, when you think about this being full of water, then you can see why I said I always wondered if kids wanted to play in it. And he said he uh, Lawrence wrote a log Lawrence's down it. Lawrence's father. Lawrence's father. <laughs> That's fun. Water. It'd be and, like a water slide. And then Lawrence said he wrote it from Ball Creek, which is about six miles above us here. Yeah, wow. it's fun. It's a very steep grade that we're on. You can see up there this beautiful rock cliff goes continues on up even above that one. So then it can. When you think about the steepness of where we're at, and then think about the work it took to dig out this flume by hand. It's an amazing feat, ingenuity there. And then they floated the logs out. Just amazing. The other thing that's peculiar to me is that one of those handles in that chimney. Oh. Needle person. Hope you enjoyed stogging around Nolan Creek with us today. Those great stories of people from days gone by that Don shared, I know you enjoyed them. The beautiful scenery. I have a real connection to this place. It's the second time I've been here and I felt that one, that connection. 
But I feel that in a lot of places in Western North Carolina when I go back in the mountains, I, I always think about the people who once lived there and how their descendants maybe are my family and how they're at least the family members that I live around, my neighbors, you know, they're part of them. I always feel that connection. But on this trip, I had a wonderful, um, I found out something wonderful. Don shared with me that he and I both have a direct connection to Nolan Creek. Way back in our families, our lines both have the line of Ball, B-A-L-L, -L, and we had Ball family members who actually called Nolan Creek home. So I do have a real connection. Maybe that's why I felt that, or maybe it's just the beautiful scenery. But I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, I hope you'll continue to drop back by often as I celebrate Appalachia, which includes those that went before.